Good evening aspirants, I have an announcement regarding your prelims preparation. This is about the pre-storming batch 3. The orientation for this batch is already concluded and the first test will commence on 20th November 2022. Those who have missed the chance to enroll in this program, the window is still open. Use it and register to enhance your prelim score. With this information, let me welcome you all to the Hindu Daily News Analysis for the date 13th of November 2022. The articles taken up for today's discussion are displayed here. You can have a look. With this, let's get into the first article discussion. Now, see this article here. It is about the diabetes webinar that was held before the World Diabetes Day. See, World Diabetes Day is on November 14th. In the webinar, it was said that it is wrong to think diabetes starts only when one has high blood sugar levels. Hyperglycemia and biochemical abnormalities happen at least 10 years before the onset of the disease. This is the crux of the news article given here. In this context, let us understand about diabetes in prelims perspective. First of all, let us see what is diabetes. Diabetes mellitus. It is more commonly known as diabetes. It is nothing but a disease that happens when the body can't process blood sugar, which is also known as glucose. See, when we eat, our body breaks the food into glucose. Then the glucose is sent into the bloodstream to fuel the cells in the body with energy. This triggers the pancreas to release a hormone called insulin. This insulin only helps the glucose to enter the cells. What we have seen till now is the normal process which happens in everyone's body. Then what will happen in case of diabetes? See, in case of diabetes, the pancreas either won't make enough insulin or the body cells won't use the insulin produced by the pancreas properly. This leads to high levels of glucose in the blood which in turn causes symptoms of diabetes. Now, this is the basics about the diabetes. Now, let us see its types. See, there are four different types of diabetes. We will see them one by one. Firstly, let us look at type 1. See, type 1 diabetes occurs when the pancreas doesn't make enough insulin. This means that one has to take insulin every day. It is usually diagnosed in kids, teens and young adults. Also note that it can happen at any age. See, it is caused because of the autoimmune condition. This means that the immune system attacks the cells that produce insulin in pancreas and destroys them. Other factors that cause type 1 diabetes include genetics and environmental factors. See, a viral infection can also trigger type 1 diabetes. I am saying it once again. Here, note the point that it can happen at any age. So, if a question comes in the prelims stating that type 1 diabetes happens only in young adults, the statement is wrong. It can happen at any time. This is all about type 1 diabetes. The next one is type 2. See, type 2 diabetes occurs when the pancreas is not making enough insulin or the body isn't using the insulin well. This type is more common over the age of 40. But know that this can also happen at any age. See, the cause of type 2 is insulin resistance. It is a condition where the cells in the body do not respond to insulin and the cells will not be able to take glucose from the blood. So, the pancreas pumps out more insulin to get blood sugar into cells. This is because insulin only helps glucose to enter the cells. Over time, cells stops responding to insulin. This is only called as insulin resistance. And eventually, the pancreas gives up producing insulin and blood sugar will keep on rising. This is all about the second type. Now moving on to see the third type. The third one is gestational diabetes. It is developed during pregnancy. It usually disappears after the baby is born, but it increases the risk of developing type 2 diabetes later on. Now we will see its cause. When a person is pregnant, the placenta makes more hormones. In some women, these hormones can cause insulin resistance, which leads to high blood sugar. This is all about the third type. Finally, pre-diabetes. See, technically, it is not a distinct type of diabetes. So, what do you think it is? See, it is a condition where a person has elevated blood sugar levels that aren't high enough to qualify as type 2 diabetes. So, this pre-diabetes increases the risk of developing type 2 diabetes. 
with this we have seen all the four different types of diabetes through this discussion we came to know about the disease diabetes and its types with this information now let's move on to see the next article take a look at this two articles here the first article talks about the 19th asian india summit in that summit delegations declared the establishment of asian india comprehensive strategic partnership and also reaffirmed the importance of freedom of navigation and over flight and this second article says that in the asian summit us said that it will work with a strategically vital coalition of southeast asian nations this is the crux of the news articles given here in this context we are going to learn about asean in prelims perspective first of all asean is expanded as association of southeast asian nations it was established on 8th august 1967 in bangkok thailand it was established with the signing of asean declaration which is also known as bangkok declaration this is all about the formation of asean now coming to the members present in it see it is a regional organization of 10 southeast asian and pacific rim countries it includes the countries of singapore vietnam philippines myanmar brunei indonesia malaysia cambodia laos and thailand the map of the asian countries is given here you can go through it now coming to its fundamental purpose see asian has some aims and purposes as per the asian declaration i have given here those aims pause the video and go through it now coming to the article it is about the asian summit the asian summit is the highest policy making body in asian it comprises of the heads of the state or government of asian member states the asian summit meetings are held twice annually at a time to be determined by the chair of the asian summit the first asian summit was held in bali indonesia the current chair of asean for 2022 is cambodia now coming to india specific information see the 19th asean india summit was held on november 12th asean and india began holding annual summits from 2002 to elevate political ties security economic and socio cultural ties this is what is discussed in the first article which we saw earlier and i have given here the outcomes of this 19th india asean summit just give it a glance just for your additional information i will tell you other forums in which india and asean are engaged it includes east asian summit asian post ministerial conference with india the asian regional forum the asian defense ministers meeting and the now expanded asean maritime forum with this we have come to the end of this discussion through this discussion we came to know about asean the members of it the motto of it and also about the link between india and asean with this information now let's move on to the next article look at these two articles both these articles are talking about the ongoing cop27 this year's conference of parties is being held in the city of sham el sheik in egypt these two articles talks about the compensation fund tipping point in climate change and a report highlighting the effects of climate change this is all about these two articles before seeing these points in detail in today's discussion let us first see about unfccc and then the paris climate agreement i have highlighted here the syllabus regarding this discussion you can go through it let us start with unfccc or the united nations framework convention on climate change in december 1990 the united nations general assembly established the intergovernmental negotiating committee for a framework convention on climate change this committee held five sessions where more than 150 states discussed about targets and time tables for emissions reductions finance mechanisms technology transfer and common but differentiated responsibilities of developed and developing countries were the other major discussion topics the negotiations led to a convention called un framework convention on climate change which is shortly known as unfccc in may 1992 the text of this convention was adopted at the united nations headquarters in new york In June 1992 at the Earth Summit in Rio this convention was opened for signature the convention brought the world together to curb greenhouse gas emissions and to adapt to climate change see it has two sister conventions which were also agreed in Rio they are UN convention on biological diversity and the convention to combat desertification 
on march 21st 1994 the unf triple c entered into force it has been ratified by 197 countries till now the countries that have ratified the convention are called unf triple c conference of parties the parties agreed to meet annually at the conference of parties to negotiate multilateral responses to climate change the headquarters of cop is located in bonn germany you may have questions about whether unf triple c is legally binding or not the answer for this question is no c unf triple c is itself not legally binding it does not set mandatory limits on greenhouse gas emissions for individual countries and contains no enforcement mechanisms but the protocols that are the result of unf triple c conference of parties like the kyoto protocol and the paris agreement set emission targets the set emission targets leads to binding enforcement mechanisms which makes them legally binding this is a brief introduction about unf triple c now let us take up the paris agreement for discussion the paris agreement was adopted by 196 countries at cop 21 which was held in paris in december 2015 it is a legally binding international treaty on climate change through this agreement the world nations agreed to limit global warming to well below 2 degree celsius preferably limited to 1.5 degree celsius it also aims to strengthen the ability of countries to deal with climate change the paris agreement introduced the concept of nationally determined contribution it requires all parties to put forward their best efforts through their nationally determined contributions these ndc are like climate pledges made by the countries and the pledges are totally voluntary the paris agreement also have a provision requiring developing countries to send 100 billion dollars annually to their developing counterparts This was being done to help the developing countries in their emission reduction measures. This is all about the Paris Agreement. Now coming to the points mentioned in the articles. The countries in the COP27 will be focusing on three things. Firstly, they will try to review the progress made by the world nations so far in regards to the emission control. Secondly, they will try to raise the global ambition for emission reduction in the future. Finally the discussion will be about the funds to help vulnerable countries adapt to climate change although these three points sound good on paper climate scientists are worried why are they worried firstly according to un ep's emission gap report 2022 even if all the world nations strictly implement their ndcs there is a high possibility that global warming will rise to 1.8 degree celsius Secondly the report also says that compared to 2019 the global CO2 emissions have increased in the year 2021 this trend will continue till the year 2030 if this happens the effect on global climate will be disastrous now coming to the third point the report also says that the G20 countries amount for 75% of global emissions The richest among the G20 nations are responsible for accumulated emissions since the industrial revolution. Here the richest nation tag denotes those western countries which were emitting a huge quantity of carbon dioxide from the 1900s onwards. Here note that the scientific community is also worried about the tipping point. What is the tipping point? Tipping point is a scenario that once reached there is no coming back and it will result in irreversible consequences. The article mentions about scientist Johan Rockström who says that the tipping point will be reached when global warming reaches 1.5 degrees Celsius. When this happens there will be collapse of Greenland ice sheet and West Antarctic ice sheet. This will also lead to the thawing of the boreal permafrost which will have an impact on the monsoons. Johan Rockström is also worried that the current steps taken by the global countries will not be adequate to limit the global temperature rise to 1.5 degrees Celsius. Even if by some miracle we manage to limit global temperature rise to 1.5 degrees Celsius, there will still be damage to the environment. According to the 6th assessment report of the IPCC, by 2040 there will be biodiversity loss, arctic ice loss and threat to coastal environments. This will result in a spiraling of conflicts, migration of affected people and challenges to access to water and energy in urban areas due to increase in migration. If we allow global temperatures to rise to 2 degrees Celsius, the following will be the consequences. 
Firstly, there will be a decline in glaciers. Secondly, due to decline in glaciers, there will be less snow melt or melted water from the glaciers. So, the rivers will dry up. This will result in less water for irrigation and human settlements and also for the animals. On the other hand, there will be increase in flooding due to extreme weather events which include heavy rainfall. This will make 18% of the species on land to go extinct. This is about the tipping point and the effects of global warming as mentioned in the article. Now, let us see the negotiations that took place in COP27. The point of conflict in COP27 is the issue surrounding the compensation mechanism. We all know that it is the industrialized nations that contributed to the majority of the historic emissions. It is due to their actions that the rest of the world's nation are facing the consequences of climate change. So, countries most affected by the effects of a changing climate have been seeking loss and damage payments from the rich industrialized nations. These countries want the rich industrialized nations to provide funding to climate affected countries apart from the $100 billion mandated in the Paris Agreement. This particular issue came up during the discussions during the COP26 Glasgow and the industrialized nations did not accept the compensation mechanism. Likewise, this time also the industrialized countries mainly the US has not accepted the compensation mechanism through which the industrialized countries provide funds to the climate change affected countries. This is all about the negotiations that is happening in the COP27. With this we have come to the end of this discussion. Through this discussion, we learned about the term UNFCCC, key points in the Paris Climate Agreement and also about the COP27 which is right now happening in Egypt. With these learned points, now let us move on to the next article. Take a look at this news article. It is about the development of personalized cancer treatment by using cell editing. The immune cells in our body can naturally detect cancer cells. But the thing is that the cancer cells are fast multiplying and hence they undergo a lot of mutation. Due to mutation of the cancer cells, our body's immune system's capability to recognize and attack cancer cells is compromised. This is where gene editing comes in. Using gene editing techniques like CRISPR, new genes are added to our body's immune cells. After the addition of the new genes, our immune cells can better identify mutations in the cancer cells. This is how personalized cancer treatment is developed by cell editing. This method of using our own cells to fight cancer is called immunotherapy. This is all about the news article given here. While discussing about the article, I mentioned about CRISPR technology, right? So, in our discussion today, we will focus on CRISPR gene editing technology. The full form of CRISPR technology is CRISPR-Cas9. Here, Cas9 denotes the molecular scissors that is used to cut DNA. CRISPR-Cas9 technology was adapted from a naturally occurring gene editing system that bacteria use as an immune defense. When infected with viruses, bacteria capture small pieces of viruses DNA and they insert them into their own DNA in a particular pattern to create segments known as CRISPR arrays. The CRISPR arrays allows the bacteria to remember the viruses. If the viruses attack again, the bacteria produce RNA segments from the CRISPR arrays that recognize and attack the specific regions of the virus's DNA. The bacteria then use Cas9 or a similar enzyme to cut the DNA apart, which disables the virus. This technology is now employed by us humans for genome editing. The procedure involved in CRISPR-Cas9 technology is this. First, they create a small piece of RNA for guidance. This is similar to RNA segments that the bacteria produce from the CRISPR array. See, when introduced into cells, the guide RNA recognizes the intended DNA sequence and it attaches itself to a specific target sequence in a cell's DNA and it also attaches to the Cas9 enzyme and then the Cas9 enzyme cuts the DNA at the targeted location. If you had paid close attention to what I discussed earlier, you would have found parallels between this and what happened in the bacteria. Here, note that apart from Cas9 enzymes, other enzymes like CPF1 can also be used here. And once the DNA is cut, the researchers use their cell's own DNA repair machinery to add or delete pieces of genetic material. This is all about CRISPR technology. 
Through this discussion, we came to know about immunotherapy and also about CRISPR technology in detail. With this information, now let's move on to the next article discussion. See this article here. It says that Ministry of Home Affairs will be organizing the third ministerial No Money for Terror conference next week. This is about the news article given here. So, in this discussion, we are going to discuss about the No Money for Terror conference. First of all, know that the conference was first held in Paris in 2018. It was again held in Melbourne in 2019. And the third ministerial conference was planned to be held in 2020. But as you all know that due to COVID pandemic travel restrictions, it got postponed. So now it is going to be held in Delhi on November 18th and 19th. It is expected that around 75 countries will participate in the conference. See, the hosting of this conference shows the importance given by the government of India to the issue of international terrorism. Now, coming to the aims of the conference. See, the conference aims to progress the discussions on combating terrorist financing that are held in previous two conferences, that is, in Paris and Melbourne. Secondly, it also intends to include discussions on technical, legal, regulatory and cooperation aspects of all facets of terrorism financing. Thirdly, it attempts to set the pace for other high-level official and political deliberations focused on countering terrorist financing. These are the three main aims of the third ministerial conference of No Money for Terror. See, globally, countries have been affected by terrorism and militancy for several years. Major causes include disorderly geopolitical environment and armed sectarian conflicts. India has also faced many terrorist attacks in the past. Examples include 2008 Mumbai attack, 2002 Parliament blast, 2019 Pulwama attack, etc. See, the consequences of these terrorist activities include poor governance, political instability, economic deprivation and large ungoverned spaces, etc. So, India is determined to fight against terrorism. Also know that India was host to two global events in the month of October. They were the annual General Assembly of Interpol in Delhi, and the other one is a special session of the UN Counter-Terrorism Committee in Mumbai and Delhi. Here you can see that both of these two global events were somewhere linked to terrorism. This shows the importance given by India to the zero tolerance policy against terrorism. With this, we have come to the end of this discussion. Through this discussion, we came to know about the No Money for Terror Conference. With this information, now let's move on to the next article discussion. Have a look at this news article. This news article talks about the massive teacher shortage faced by the A. Clavia model residential schools. The ministry said that the recruitment process is going on and soon the issue will be resolved. This is the crux of the article given here. In this context, let us learn about the A. Clavia schools in film's perspective. See, A. Clavia schools are residential schools run by the Indian government with specialized curriculum that addresses the tribal students' specific needs. Thus, they function with an objective to impart quality education to the ST students in the remote areas of the country. This is to enable them to avail professional educational courses and get employment in various sectors. Here note that special focus is given to the order and development of the students. The scheme was started in the year 1997 and today around 1 lakh tribal students are studying in 372 schools all across the country. Now coming to the grants for these institutions. The grants for the development of infrastructure of these schools are provided by the central government. This is under the mandate of Article 275 Class 1 of the Indian Constitution. Aspirants make note of this Article 275. This article provides for the preferential treatment of certain states over the others for receiving additional grants from the centre. The article also says that states with tribal population and states containing scheduled areas are entitled to additional revenue. This is to further the development of the tribes. You can quote this article in your main answer to the questions relating to the constitutional safeguards for the tribals. Now coming back. The Ekalavia schools function under an apex body called National Education Society for Tribal Students. This is under the Ministry of Tribal Affairs. Here note that there is again a parallel body in the state called State Education Society for Tribal Students. While National Education Society for Tribal Students provide broader framework for functioning of these schools, 
their state counterparts try to incorporate regional variations into the functioning of these ekalavya schools here note that that these schools have specific center of excellence for sports for india to move on top of the olympic ladder talents from every part of the country needs to be nurtured and this is what specifically the center of excellence for sports in these schools tries to do this is all about the ekalavya model residential schools through this discussion we have seen about the ekalavya model schools about article 275 and finally about the administrative mechanism through which these schools are administered with this information now let's move on to the next article take a look at this news article this news article talks about the line of actual control the indian army chief says that the situation along this line of actual control in eastern ladakh is stable but at the same time it is unpredictable the news is that the issue in the five of the seven friction points has been resolved and the focus was now on the remaining two this is the crux of the article given here in this context we will learn about the line of actual control line of control and also about the less talked mcmogan line in prelims perspective firstly take the line of control see it separates india and pakistan let us know about the history behind it in august 1947 jammu and kashmir was a princely state of the size of 2.06 lakh square miles but two months later pakistan invaded jammu and kashmir here note that pakistan invaded despite having signed a standstill agreement with the princely state so this made jammu and kashmir turn to india for help and both india and jammu and kashmir signed the instrument of accession after signing the instrument india responded to the pakistani intrusion it resulted in the 1949 war then came the intervention of united nations which accepted the merger of jammu and kashmir with india a ceasefire line was drawn depending on the actual positions held by the two armies so what happened is the ceasefire line temporarily bifurcated jammu and kashmir with india getting control of about 65% of the state and pakistan the rest 35% this ceasefire line was formalized in the karachi agreement signed in the later part of the 1949 it was signed between india and pakistan with two un observers signing as witnesses here note that the sanctity of the ceasefire line was to be maintained till the final settlement of the jammu and kashmir issue However, two incidents altered the status quo on the Jammu and Kashmir during 1960s. One is the India-China War of 1962 and the other one is the India-Pakistan War of 1965. Firstly, in 1962, China humbled India and captured nearly 20% of the princely state. The area captured was Aksai Chin. Here, note that China denies India's sovereignty over the Coal Desert region. which is nothing but aksai chin further in the year 1963 pakistan signed an agreement with china and handed over about 2000 square miles area in northern kashmir to china you can see the ceded part in the map present here then came the 1965 war it saw both india and pakistan occupying each other's territories india captured nearly 750 square miles while pakistan taked over about 200 square miles but with the signing of the tashkent agreement both militaries returned to their previous positions along the line of control then came the 1971 war the war ended with shimla agreement which turned the ceasefire line into line of control this is how it is called today and if you want to know more elaborately about this bangladesh liberation war do watch our hindu news analysis of the date december 16 2021 So from all this we have discussed till now we can note that there was no line of control before the 1972 Shimla agreement this agreement also practically junked the UN resolution as the two countries agreed to resolve all disputes through bilateral talks so the line of control thus drawn gave Pakistan control over Pakistan occupied Kashmir and Gilgit Baltistan then the rest of the jammu and kashmir minus aksai chin is situated on the indian side of the line of control here note that line of control was again changed in the year 1984 this is because siachen glacier came into the focus in the early 1970s when pakistanis got to know that there is an indian expedition to siachen glacier they went about their plan to capture siachen aggressively so they ordered a full range of mountaineering gear from a london based firm 
This film was also a supplier to the Indian Army. So, the information got leaked to India. Now, the Indian Army launched Operation Meghdood to turn the Siachen into one of its bases. See, Siachen is the largest glacier in the Trans-Himalayan region. It is a triangular block of literally 76 km length. Now, coming back, Pakistan claims that Siachen Glacier belongs to the part of Jammu and Kashmir given to its control under both the Karachi Agreement and the Shimla Agreement. But India claims otherwise. India argues that the crest line beyond NJ9842 follows a northwest direction and ends with Indra Kol of Siachen Glacier. See, this Indra Kol is the area where territories of Jammu and Kashmir meet the lands occupied by Pakistan and the area which was gifted by Pakistan to China. So, the existing line of control runs from Manawar in Jammu to Indra Kol on the tri-junction in the Karakoram mountain range. The Indian and Pakistani troops have to maintain a no man's land of 500 yards on each side of the line of control. Thus, we can say that Pakistan and India has agreed to uphold the line of control and the LOC has been delineated on a map by both sides. This is all about the line of control. In contrast, the alignment of line of actual control has never been agreed upon and it is neither been delineated nor demarcated. That is, there is no official map in the public domain that depicts the line of actual control. So, this line of actual control can best be thought of as an idea reflecting the territories that are at present under the control of each side pending a resolution of the boundary dispute. Now, let us see about this line of actual control. See, LAC is the demarcation that separates India controlled territory from the China controlled territory in the Kashmir region. Note that the length of Sino-Indian border is 3488 km. You can see here in the map that it covers the western sector which includes the Union Territory of Ladakh and middle sector which includes Himachal Pradesh and Uttarakhand. It also covers the Macmogan line in the east which covers Sikkim and Arunachal Pradesh. Know the history behind this. See, in 1913, the British Indian government had called a tripartite conference. And in this conference, the boundary between India and Tibet was formalized. But this Indo-Tibetan boundary is however disputed by China which terms it as illegal. And then in 1957, China occupied Aksai Chin and built a road through it. This episode was followed by intermittent clashes along the border. Finally, it culminated in the border war of 1962. Then after the war, a boundary came into existence. This was known as the line of actual control. Here note that China occupies more than 38,000 square kilometer in the erstwhile state of Jammu and Kashmir in the Ladakh region. This region is known as Aksai Chin. You can see this disputed area in this image. But know that India recognized the Macmogan line and considers it to be the actual line of control between India and China. While China does not recognize the Macmogan line. See, Macmogan line is a boundary line present in the eastern part of the Indochina border. It lies to the north of Arunachal Pradesh which also borders with the China. You can see the Macmogan line in this image. This Macmogan line was breached by China in the year 1962 when the Chinese army personnel invaded the eastern boundary of India through the Arunachal Pradesh route. However, they left the region after occupying it for some days. So, now practically talking, Macmogan line is the international boundary present between Arunachal Pradesh and China in the present day. This is all about the Macmogan line. Through this discussion, we have learned about the line of control and also about the line of actual control and the Macmogan line. With this, we have come to the end of first part of today's discussion. Moving on to the second part, which is nothing but prelims practice question discussion. Today, I have taken five different questions for our discussion. Let's start with the first question. Which among the following countries form the founding nations of Association of Southeast Asian Nations? Five different countries are given. You have to choose the correct pairs. The correct answer for this question is option A. 1, 2 and 3 only. See, the question asks for the founding nations. It is not asking for the member states of the ASEAN present now. So, the founding nations of ASEAN were Indonesia, Malaysia, Philippines, Singapore and Thailand. So, the correct answer for this question is option A. Malaysia, Thailand and Singapore. Now, moving on to the second question. See, this question is regarding diabetes. The question asks for the correct statement. Coming to the first statement. Pre-diabetes is a condition that develops only in newborn babies. This statement is incorrect. 
it does not develop only in newborn babies it can also develop in older humans it is just a condition when there is elevated levels of blood sugar in the blood and as we saw in the discussion it is technically not a type of diabetes but just a precondition which can translate into diabetes over time so the first statement is wrong now coming to the second statement type 1 diabetes is caused due to insulin resistance this statement is incorrect as we saw in the discussion type 1 diabetes is caused due to autoimmune condition genetics and environmental factors type 2 diabetes was only caused due to insulin resistance so this statement is also wrong so the correct answer for this question is option d neither one nor two moving on to the third question let me read out the question for you with reference to a clavia model residential schools consider the following statements statement 1 it functions under the ministry of education this statement is wrong it functions under the ministry of tribal affairs so the statement 1 is incorrect now coming to the second statement non tribal students can also get admission in a clavia schools yes apart from scheduled tribes other students can also take admission in a clavia model residential schools 10% of the seats of eklavia schools can be filled by non st candidates here note that priority shall be given to children of eklavia school staffs and those children who have lost their parents to left wing extremism and insurgencies so statement 2 is correct the question is asking for incorrect statement so the correct answer for this question is option a one only now moving on to the fourth question this is also a two statement question this question is regarding financial action task force fatf let me read out the first statement initially fatf was established to examine and develop measures to combat money laundering and in 2001 the fatf expanded its mandate to incorporate efforts to combat terrorist financing statement 1 is correct the financial action task force was established in july 1989 by a group of seven summit in paris initially it was established to examine and develop measures to combat money laundering as said in the statement 1 in october 2001 the fatf expanded its mandate to incorporate efforts to combat terrorist financing in addition to money laundering also know that in april 2012 it added efforts to counter the financing of proliferation of weapons of mass destruction so statement 1 is correct now coming to the second statement Currently there are 190 members in FATF and it also includes two regional organizations this statement is incorrect see there are currently only 39 members of the FATF it includes 37 countries and two regional organization the regional organizations are the gulf cooperation council and the european commission so the statement 2 is incorrect the question is asking for the incorrect statement the correct answer for this question is option b two only now moving on to the final question Let me read out the question. Consider the following statements with respect to India's border. Statement one: Line of control is a border line between India and Pakistan. This statement is correct. This is what we have seen in today's discussion. Line of control is a border line between India and Pakistan. Now moving on to the second statement. Durand line serves as a border between India and China. See, this statement is incorrect. Durand line actually serves as a border between Pakistan and Afghanistan. See the Duran line is a 2640 km border between Afghanistan and Pakistan. It emerged as a result after an agreement between British India and Abdur Rahman Khan who was the ruler of Afghanistan. The agreement was signed on November 12, 1892 in Kabul, Afghanistan. So the statement 2 is incorrect. The question is asking for the incorrect statement. So the correct answer for this question is option B 2 only. The prelims practice questions are displayed here. Interested aspirants can post the right answer in the comment section. The mains practice question is displayed here. Interested aspirants can write your answers and post it in the comment section. With this, we have come to the end of this discussion. If you have liked our video, please hit the like button, do comment and share it with your friends. Thanks for listening.